we've got another uh, discussion between um, Associate Professor, Professor David Pook and Juliet Donitas about treatment choices and decision making. And really this is a perfect uh, addition to what we've just heard um, Haryana and Michael talk about. Associate Professor Pook specialises in treatment of prostate, kidney, bladder and testicular cancers. He's the principal investigator on multiple international clinical trials treating urological cancers and is deputy chair of ANSUP's Kidney Cancer Subcommittee. And Juliet has a great story to tell about her experiences on an ANSUP clinical trial. In 2019, she was diagnosed with metastasized sarcomoid renal cell carcinoma and eventually participated in an ANSUP clinical trial for rare kidney cancers led by Associate Professor David Pook. So uh, can I say David or Dr Pook? <laughs> Associate Professor is just far too long. <laughs> David's fine. <laughs> so look, when you're... Um, <laughs> what information do you look at, you know, when you're deciding um, about options for your patients. So you've got Juliet's come in to you and then, so what goes through your mind as the clinician as to how, you know, what am I going to offer this patient? How is she, what's she going to benefit best from? Juliet was an easy one, uh, not for a good reason. Um, her sort of kidney cancer was a non-clear cell kidney cancer and at the time there were no funded treatments available in Australia whatsoever. So according to standard treatment in Australia we were supposed to move to palliative care and that was it there were no treatments um, so it the timing was pretty good because we had Craig Getty's study uh, the Unison study open um, and that was an ANZAP study and I, I know Craig worked really hard pushing the drug companies to try and get um, them to look at the non-clear cell cancers um, it seemed a little unfair that there were 25% of kidney cancers just because the pathology didn't look a certain way um, down the microscope that they, they weren't included in all these previous studies and so there was, we were left with this big gap in treatment and so uh, a lot of background work went in to try and push to get this study up and running um, and so with Juliet it was pretty straightforward. It was like, look, we have this study, we, we, we don't know how well it's going to work in your sort of cancer. In the clear cell cancers we know it works well, immunotherapy, but we don't know in your sort of cancer. So there was a leap of faith as well for Juliet because the, the, we hadn't used the immunotherapies in her sort of cancer. So we sort of knew about toxicity, but not about would this work or not. So Juliet then, you know, you, you've been given this information. Um, what went through your mind when he was explaining all this to you and going, well, you know, here's something that you might like to try, but we don't know. Well, I think like anyone would, if you've got a chance, if there's some hope, you take it. So that was probably the first thing was whether it would work or not at least you're a part of a process of for the next person that it might work for them. So what information, did you uh, look at any other information when he sort of spoke to you about this? Did you go off and I guess building on a bit of what Michael and Haryana talked about, did you do any Googling? Did you go into any groups? Did you do any reading to, to help support your decision and clarify what he was asking you to, to do? The decision to do it was immediate. That was a definite yes. Um, but, of course, you do Google, you do research and you do read. Um, and it was pretty depressing reading, actually. So I was pretty happy to have an option. Can I just grab something that Juliet said then? And it's probably a reason why a lot of us do oncology. Um, so she came into the clinic and she was pretty scared and she was really worried about a cancer that had spread and she knew that it spread. And you heard what she said then. She goes, well, if it didn't work for me, it might work for someone else. And that's not an unusual thing that we hear in clinic. So uh, we're pretty lucky. We, have, we end up working with a group of people that are in the worst possible time of their life, thinking about other people, and it happens all the time. So I'm usually in awe of people that are like that. I don't know if I'd be so generous at that time. <laughs> So as you were explaining or talking to Juliet about this trial, how did you go about explaining what the treatment might be and what, what the side effects of that treatment might be and trying to make it acceptable to her to have this attitude of, well, I'll give it a go? It's actually a really good question. Um, because it's a clinical trial, it's actually tricky. Um, 
if anyone's um, been given any information about a clinical trial, the look, the, the ethics committees are trying to do the right thing, right? So they're trying to say you can't oversell a study. Um, but the problem we have is that we have to hand a patient a really long form telling them about... <laughs> she's got it. <laughs> um, oh. and, and you would know when you read it. How, how much positive was in the consent form? Not a lot. Not a lot. No. So it, it really focuses on, right, you're going to have to have all these visits, all these blood tests. We're going to want to take an extra tablespoon on this day and two tablespoons on this day. And you're going to have this visit, this visit, this visit. And then it launches into... This one was long, wasn't it? This was yeah. four pages, maybe five pages of potential side effects, and some of them sound horrendous. Yeah. So when it gets into the... Re it'll go right down to the one in a thousand mm. and basically gets to the point with the immunotherapy, it starts out pretty OK, you know, a bit of a rash, maybe a bit of diarrhoea, and then, <laughs> then gets to the bottom and says it can cause irreversible damage to any organ in your body, including brain, heart, lung. It, it gets... So, yeah, it, it, it's tricky for us because with a standard therapy, we can talk more about um, what we generally see, but obviously being careful to say, look, there are certain risks here, like there are some nasty things that can happen, but that, we don't see it that much. With a clinical trial, it's tricky because we can't oversell the trial. So, yeah, it's, it's a hard conversation saying, look, we do use this treatment all the time. I know it sounds bad on paper. Um, and luckily it was, a, it was a treatment that we've used before. So that wasn't such a problem for us. The problem really was, was it going to work? That's what we couldn't answer. Mm. And it's interesting because it turns out that your sort of cancer, funnily enough, um, responds very well to immunotherapy, which wasn't something that was apparent at the time we put you on the study. So that's how fast things move. Yeah, so when you... But how did you, did you do anything in specific way to help Juliet make that decision? Like you say, here's this big document to read. Um, did you, what extras did you do? Did you have to go through the process of re-explaining it to her or did you leave yourself open, say, come read it and come back? Yeah, so uh, the other thing the Ethics Committee doesn't want us to do is to try and oversell or pressure anyone. Mm -hmm. So we need to make it very clear that if we have a clinical trial available, it's an option. Um, you don't have to go on. Um, we'll try and find something else if we can't put you on the study. But the way we normally would do it was, would be to have an initial talk about the trial, give you some information, which is a you know, big, thick thing of information, go and read through, talk to your family about it, talk to your doctor if you want about it, come back. Um, and we've just got to be careful if we're going to try and you know, sign someone onto a clinical trial. But if they're really saying, oh, I'm not sure, we've got to be careful to say, look, you can take your time, you don't have to go on now, why don't you go back, speak to someone else, take some more time, come back and, and make sure that you're ready to go on because we don't want someone to go into a clinical trial that's not sure either. If something goes wrong and someone feels like they've been really pushed by the trial team, they're not going to be very happy. So it, it definitely needs to be a shared decision. Mm -hmm. I think we both need to be aligned and both say, right, this is what we want to do and then we do it. Yeah. So, so Juliet, did you take this big document and did you go home and then read it with family and friends and have other people or were other people wanting to have some input did you like uh, thinking about what Michael said he liked to have control and he liked to be in charge is that the attitude you uh, I, took? I did actually um, I took it home and I read it and I highlighted questions I had wrote notes and then asked the questions and got answers but it was more for myself yeah did you find that uh, family and friend try, friends tried to influence you about not being involved? Because I think one of the problems we have is what, the, what everyone understands, some of the myths around clinical trials and you're being experimented on and this is not going to be good for you and why would you do this? Did you have that sort of...? Um, not in my immediate family. They, my younger sister's a GP, so she was really all for it. Um, but some acquaintances, some people I knew questioned whether I should be doing it. Mm. So there was that attitude out. Yes, because sometimes people don't understand that there's a big process behind a clinical trial that gets it to be a place that it's OK for you to be part of. And yeah. So I think what Juliet just said, you know, making uh, some notes and then going back and having... That's part of the decision process, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when you went back, did you still have that 
trepidation about what are, what's the side effects of this? Or how did you manage that sort of part of it? I think you always would have fear of what might happen, but if you only concentrate on that, then you can't go forward. It's something you've just got to accept yeah. and go with it. Yeah. So what would you say then to somebody else, for instance, who is thinking about whether they would go on a clinical trial or not, you know, given there's some unknowns in, in there? I think asking the questions um, is probably the most important thing. And understanding what you accept as what, what you're comfortable with, what side effects you can live with, what, what you can cope with, what your family can cope with, your circumstances. I think it's just so individual that you need to ask the questions that affect you. Mm -hmm. You're always very positive when you came came to your trial visits. I don't know how, how you managed that. You were always... <laughs> but every time you came in, it was always about the positive. You didn't... Yeah. So, I mean, we had to go through all the side effects, but I don't know, you seemed to just sort of be able to co say, yep, those are the side effects, but, you know, yep. we're moving forward. How did yeah. you do that? Because I believed it was going to work. 100%. Yeah. That's, that's the eternal optimist, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think what you're saying is when people do go to their doctor and whatever the treatment is going to be, you're eternally optimistic that this is going to be it. Do you find that? Do you find that, David, a, a, um, something that you have to kind of balance in people that they might get a bit too optimistic about some of the the what's going to be happening or have unrealistic expectations? Do you have to manage that in? people who come in to see you? Not so much Juliet, but maybe just generally? Um, I think sometimes, um, but I, d I don't think the way we live our lives is pessimistic. I don't think we constantly think about the fact that we're all going to die at some stage. And so you don't, you don't want to manage it too much. I think it definitely needs to be realistic. I think people need to understand that there are chances involved, you know, and if we can give some sort of um, guess as to what we think the chance of the drug working, then I think we need to do that. But I, I think it's fine if people are positive. I think they need to be positive. They're going through yeah. a lot yeah. um, and I, I, I don't think you would do what you have to do to go into a clinical trial if you didn't think you were going to get anywhere. I mean, it's a big ask of anyone. I mean, you know, it wasn't close. How far was your drive to the trial centre? It wasn't that close, was it? Oh, not too bad. Mm. 50 minutes. So it's an hour each way and then the scans were on a different day so you had to go back and do scans on the different day, um, the blood tests and all that sort of stuff. Like it's, you know, that it, it wasn't that easy, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty busy trial centre, like it's, it's a lot involved so I think you need to, I think you need to feel that you're, you don't want to get rid of people's positivity I don't think otherwise, I don't think they would go through all of that. No, but I, I guess I was thinking more about realistic expectations. You, because as people who've been through cancer experiences, we don't want, we want to know um, exactly what's going to happen rather than something that, um, what am I trying to say? We want to have realistic expectations really um, and that's what I was trying to get at. And I, I, I keep going back to the, the comments that you've made about the big document and I guess I go back to what something that I said earlier about the, the cap and how if we get a chance to read documents and have some input, we do provide some information or input about how big a document is that you have to read. So did you find that what you had was way too much information? No, I think okay. you no, I think you need all of it and you don't have to read it all in one hit. No, <laughs> um, that's right. <laughs> no, I think for me personally, the more information, the better. If I feel like I'm fully informed, I'm more comfortable and then I can be positive. Because mm. yes, of course, there's the risk and the chance that it won't change, but you already know that. You, you, you're, not, you're not going backwards, you can only go forwards if you're trying something. And seeing all the information about the side effects, was that daunting for you or did you just take that, you know, I guess, understand what you can understand right now is probably a good thing. Did you have that philosophy or did you No, I think read using looking at the one in 1,000, one in 10,000, yeah. I think using those ratios that you then look at, these are the most common, okay, well, I'm just going to hope that I stay in that area, that I'm not venturing out into 
Well, it's good to hear you say that because I know on the on the cap we often look at documents and think, wow, what are people going to think when they see all of this? So I guess there are different people who look at these documents too, but I'm pleased to hear that you managed it. So maybe you can share some of those tips about it too. <laughs> Um, I think that's an important point, though, because uh, the human research ethics committees are driving this. And Juliet's pretty good. I mean, she is able to look at all these and then the ethics is useful, but I'm not sure you're the average patient. I think a lot of people are looking at it and they're completely overwhelmed by this 25-page document. Mm -hmm. We've had people that have looked at the one in a 1,000, sometimes the way they order things. So one of our trials led straight with this could cause a stroke. Like the first one, and we no, but we just had multiple patients just went no, nah, and they were off, That's and right. that was it. They weren't going to do it, and it was a, it wasn't that common. Um, so that there's, I think there's definitely work to be done. I think we sort of get pushed around a bit by the ethics committee, and there maybe needs to be some pushback saying, look, these documents that you're forcing people to use, they're really scaring people, and maybe there's a way. To, I don't know to nuance it. It's a huge amount of detail. Like mm. It just goes on and on and on and. You know, a lot of it, I don't know, if it was electronic, maybe. Things like privacy. I mean, if you've got 80, I don't know, my guess would be 80, 90% of people, you say, do you care about what happens to your medical information? They say, no. If you could just not click that bit and just leave those two pages off and move mm -hmm. on, it would make the whole thing a bit mm -hmm. easier. But we've got to go through every single thing. We've got to go these detailed things about um, men with prostate cancer not getting people pregnant after they've had a prostatectomy. It's impossible to do. It's just, so I don't know. I think there's, there maybe is some work that could be done by CAP groups to try and maybe yeah. just simplify some of these forms a bit. That's right. Well, good to hear you say that because that's our, one of our main aims as well. And, um, you know, not, like you say, Juliet's quite unique. I think a lot of people do worry about those sorts of things. So as we're sort of, I guess, winding up a little bit now about this discussion, what... Um, I guess, what was your experience with other people in the clinic, Juliet, not just your doctor who was seen, obviously was really great at explaining everything to you, but did you find that other people in the team were helpful as well? I think... Careful, they're all here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Linda, oh my God. <laughs> no, the nurses and the study coordinators, they're... Any time you have a question, even if it's an email or a phone call, and they can be, they are so busy, they're incredibly busy, but they will always answer you, they always get back to you, and they're your main support, they're your reassurance, and especially with COVID, when treatment, you went in by yourself, and so the nurses immediately, they're your support person because they're the ones who know exactly what you're going through, and they're there with you as you're going through it. So, thank you. And I think we find that <clears throat> those the, the support, you know, the other team members uh, are there to clarify what you've heard. Because sometimes I would, would you agree that if you're sitting in front of the doctor and he's giving you all this information, that sometimes it goes in one ear and out the other, and you go outside and think, what, what was I just told? So did you use them for that purpose too to kind of can you re-explain this to me, or did you yeah. find they just did that for you? Absolutely, and, and even if I would mention something that I thought wasn't of any consequence, the next thing you know, Dave would be bringing it up. So it had been passed along. So you really That's felt right. looked after yeah. and cared for. Yeah. So often we hear that people who've been involved with the clinical trial have do well because they're so well looked after. Would you say that that's a true statement? Yes. I don't mm. think you could have your health monitored any more closely. Yes, and because even though sometimes, would you agree that sometimes going to all those um, those interviews and having the test one day and going back for your treatment another day, and it might have been tiring for you, but when you look back, did you think that was a good thing because I had all that extra, whereas someone not going through a clinical trial might not have that interaction so closely? Yes, mm. it was a big difference. Yes, yeah. Because sometimes we worry about who's looking after me. How do I know when there's any changes? How, do, you know, if I could just see, see through my body and see what's going on, that'd be great. But that's not what happens. So you've got this other team around you, don't you? And it also just educated your 
without being on the trial further down, questions that to ask, things to look out for. Like that, you learn a lot yourself. Just yes, that's through. right. That's right. So, as we concluding now, what what would be your for anyone in the audience considering being a part of a clinical trial or um, First of all, would be asked the question, is there a trial suitable for me? But what else would you say? I'd say do it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a, an incredible opportunity to have the best outcome you can possibly have. So I, I feel really lucky that I was actually offered a trial and able to do it. I, did, I don't know if I asked you, would that, have, would that come to your mind, was that something that came in your mind earlier on when bef before you were offered the, the clinical trial? Yes. Was that something you yes. wondered whether it could be possible? I was looking for a clinical trial. Okay, that's good. Yeah. 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 And Dave, what would you say as a closing uh, point about anyone in the audience thinking about a clinical trial, what to ask their clinician, anything that might allay their concerns about thinking about it? Um, I think it's really important to um, get a good picture of what the standard treatment options are, and I think anyone can provide those. Um, and then I look at the clinical trial option, uh, uh, the clinical trials as just extra options for treatment. So if you've got a certain cancer and you've got three different treatments that the government pays for, if we can find another three clinical trials, then you get six treatments rather than three treatments. So um, I normally would just slot them in as ways of getting or trying extra lines of treatment. Um, but you also need to know that you don't have to go into a clinical trial. And if you read through one of these huge forms and there's a side effect there that really stands out and you think, but that's not OK, don't go on the trial. We'll find something else. So I think just know that they're optional. Um, they are a way that we can get sometimes get your treatments that otherwise you'd have no access to or you'd have to self-fund, um, but you don't have to. That's a really good point that sometimes we don't say often enough that it, it's the person's decision, isn't it? They don't have to do this. It's just another option that they could think about. So I'm glad you brought that up because we don't say that enough. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, um, especially Juliet, for coming and sharing your story because it's, it's a big thing to come and sh share your story with, with all these strangers. So really appreciate it. Thank you.